Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi. This is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. The Holy Spirit is not about inspiration, but power and control in the Bible. The power of the story is that it exerts control expressly to silence our voice. This facet of the biblical teaching has been the most challenging of my priestly ministry. In human terms, Scripture is a recipe for failure. It's terrible news for our projects, but good news in Luke because the things we succeed in creating separate us from the love of God. Gabriel, the functional presence of Elohim to Zacharias, channeled this power and control but Zacharias did not believe Gabriel's words. If Gabriel had conveyed the words of Zeus or Athena, Zacharias would have a point. Zacharias does not have a point. And behold, you shall be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place, because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their proper time. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 18 to 20. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Hi. This is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 433 of the Bible as Literature podcast. We have been discussing Luke's move away from the artificial center of Roman civilization, but here specifically, the artificial center of Jewish civilization, which of course in the New Testament is a critique of the artificial center of Gentile civilization. Remember that in the wilderness, if there is a center, it's the oasis which is created by God. Men build cities. God offers an oasis in the wilderness. Men create institutions, they build buildings, they create infrastructure. God gives us families. Men build statues, and they set them up inside their artificial cities. So you have artificial people inside of artificial cities. God gives us the merciful womb of our human mothers, And children are born from the merciful womb. So there's a tension that's being set up. We ask for kings and leaders and princes and authorities. We ask for these things. We want these things. But in our natural setting, in the wilderness, God assigns man's place as shepherd among the families of the earth. Man's natural condition is tribal. Now, hearing the New Testament, the first question an institutional person will ask is, well then why, why does Scripture challenge the tribal cult of Jerusalem? Because of exceptionalism, which is also, by the way, the problem of institutionalism. The tribal setting in the Syrian wilderness places the shepherd of flock among the other families of the earth. 
when we set up boundaries, when we establish control, when we brand people, remember the Herodian project, the legacy of the Hasmoneans and the Maccabees. When we play that game in Jerusalem, when we, as Father Paul said recently on his podcast, explaining Genesis chapter 34, when we use circumcision, which was given as a mechanism of brotherhood, when we use that as an excuse to kill our brothers, it's not a question of whether tribalism is good or bad. It's a question of whether or not we are submitting to the law of God. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The whole law hangs on a single word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Throughout the entire scriptural tradition, the emphasis is always shifted away from the temple shifted away from the things that men build and placed squarely on obedience to God's law. The law, Jeremiah teaches us, that is set before you. And that is what is happening again here at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke. And it is Gabriel, we will soon hear, who is confronting Zacharias with that instruction. This mechanism of the artificial cities with artificial people, it's all about control. Human beings create a city, but what's a city? A city is a wall with houses in it. You can have houses and it's not called a city, but as soon as you put that wall up around it, it's now a city. And once you have that wall, now you can keep animals out, you can keep enemies out, and you can start to control what happens within that city, and you can then start to gather the resources of the area around. In Amos, it talks about after the king's threshing. Well, what did that mean? It meant the farmers would go and they would thresh, and the first whatever percent would go to the king, go to the city, go to the residents of the city, because people in the city are not farmers, they're not shepherds, they're bureaucrats or craftsmen or whatever, and they would need to be fed. And so the first piece that the farmer would produce would go to them. And the rest, he would get to eat, he and his family. All right, this works well if everything works according to the farmer's plan. But the farmer is going to tell you pretty quickly that the farmer doesn't have a plan. The farmer's plan is to follow whatever nature is doing because nature is the one with the plan. Same with the shepherd. The shepherd knows that nature is the one with the plan. And the farmer and the shepherd both, they don't get a control. But in the city, you have the walls you can control, and you can have a nice storehouse of grain. You don't have to hope that there's not going to be a hailstorm, because you could put a nice roof over your threshed grain, and you can, you know, eat it at your leisure. This is the way that the city controls. And then they put their edifices, their idols up in the city, so they have a religion. And with that religion, same thing. They can do a certain thing, and then the God will provide the thing that they need. The people then control the powers of the heavens as well, if they perform the correct actions. And remember, we talked about Zechariah and how he was a temple functionary, but he was righteous before we knew anything about him. God just said that he was righteous, and he didn't do anything spectacular. When it was his shift to do his job, he went in, did his job, punched out, and he finished his job. That's all it said that he did. He went and burned incense, and then he came back out. So this idea of needing to control and setting up those mechanisms of control, that's exactly what Hosea and the Minor Prophets are attacking. Jeremiah to the extreme, where it says, open your gates to the Babylonians, voluntarily relinquish the control that you actually feel that you do have because God is going to burn down these walls if he needs to. The Babylonians are getting in. So why not just open up the doors and let them come in? This is what Jeremiah is telling. So actually telling the people, give up your control. You have to give it up because all this control you think you have, it's like the land in Hosea 1. Oh, the bales aren't providing for me, but I'll go back to my first husband. It was good with him. And then his first husband, Yahweh, says, 
You know, it was me all along that was providing everything. This question of control in Scripture, it's not just about control. It's about your fixation on control with respect to an imaginary artificial center. Because out among the families in the wilderness, there is definite control, as you said, Richard, through the shepherd from the mouth of instruction set before you in the law of the Lord. And that's why the mention of Gabriel soon here is critical because it makes Jeremiah through the prophet Daniel and the destruction of Jerusalem, which is transferring that control back to where it belongs. Zacharias said to the angel, how will I know this for certain? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. Again, it's your point about control. Zacharias still wants to put more incense in his censer. Zacharias still wants to figure out what the rubrics say about how to make a baby. Zacharias wants to consult the rule book. He wants to check the vision statement. Zacharias wants to consult his committee, the International Committee for White People on Ethics and Morality. What's the proper procedure for making a child? Which government agency should I consult about my defunct spermatos. It ain't going to help, Zacharias. They can't help you. They can make another building. They can make a pretty statue of what a baby looks like. They can even draw a painting. In 2022, they can make an interactive 3D depiction of what appears like a living baby, and you can get a VR headset and interact with it. But it's still not a living, breathing child. That is the purview of Elohim through the mercy he gifts us when he touches a mother's womb or when he himself functions in a motherly way towards us. Beyond your control, remember, (laughs) the Holy Spirit is a tornado. (laughs) This speech sounds very much like Abrams when he was first told about having a child and his wife laughed at this possibility that they would have a child because they were too old. How will I know this is what he wants to know. He wants to have, maybe get it in writing or something like that, you know, just to be sure this is going to happen because it doesn't make sense. So here's another thing that's important, is that he was called righteous by the Lord, but it's not because he had it figured out or he was working in the right way. Yes, Father, maybe lighting some incense in his mind was going to help something or something like that. He was ignorant. He lacked faith, but he was still considered righteous, and that's what's significant about this. We see how the grace of righteousness functions here, that it wasn't because of some ability or his standing out from the crowd that made him righteous? Because then that would mean that it was his action that made him righteous. No, the action begins with the Lord. The Lord decides that he's righteous, and then everything follows from that. And boy, I've been reading a lot of Hosea these days, especially one through three, again and again and again. It all starts with me. You don't convince the rain to come. I convinced the rain to come, and you're not going to convince me. The angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and bring this good news. Again, I want to make it clear that Gabriel, who appears in Daniel, connects this parable to the destruction of Jerusalem announced and heralded in Jeremiah. And Jeremiah's question is, where is the wise man? Where is he? Is there anyone who understands in the land, anyone, that this is about the law of the Lord? Do you really think it's about fighting Nebuchadnezzar? Come on, people. If that's what you believe, guess who you're fighting? And we've been saying this on the podcast. Father Paul has insisted upon this. We learned this from his reading of Jeremiah years ago. If you really think it's about defending 
your artificial center, your city, your institution, then you're attacking the teacher. You're attacking the prophet. Ultimately, in the New Testament, you're attacking Jesus Christ. Give me a break. Because the whole point of the good news that Gabriel is bringing here in this verse is to bring us back to the wilderness so that we can coexist in the land as the forebears of the writers of Scripture did a thousand years before Greek civilization. Are you kidding? And you want to talk about progress? A thousand years before Greek civilization, the families of the earth spoke their own languages, ate their own foods, sang their own songs, and coexisted just fine without any of our modern constructions and movements. So what are we talking about? What are we talking about? The good news that Gabriel is announcing is that the hope that was announced through Moses to the Yehudim when they were rescued from bondage in Egypt and that the prophet Joshua, despite Moses' failure, was able to sustain for them, now is being announced to the Gentiles. The new Moses, Paul, of course represented by John the Baptist, is bringing this good news to them. And Jesus, the new Joshua, this time is going to subdue the new Pharaoh, Caesar, once and for all. And it is very good news. It is hopeful. It is exceedingly good news. And it is, as we said last week, a cause for rejoicing. Not just because the new Joshua, Jesus Christ, will sustain once and for all our life in the land, but it will be the fulfillment of the prophets. Because the prophetic promise is inclusive of all the families of the earth through obedience to God's law. Remember that the Old Testament was addressed to the Yehudim, but now the same teaching which births Jesus Christ is addressed to all the families of the earth through Jesus Christ and the teaching of the Apostle Paul. That's what's happening here with the birth of John the Baptist in the story. It's the heralding of this good news. The good news that they don't control life, that there is the one who created the heavens and the earth who controls life. It's beautiful, the, the bookends that we have in Luke, how we begin with life coming from a barren womb, and we end with life coming to someone who's been crucified and lies in a stone tomb. It's nice how it rhymes in English, from womb to tomb, right? And the Lord is the one who gives life. When one recognizes that only God gives life, and that God gives life according to his good pleasure, one of the reactions that human beings have is to protect life and to be so careful because they don't want to lose it because human beings recognize their inability to create life. This is the terror that human beings have that force them to build walls and create whole religions. They're terrified of their inability to give life, to create life. And even this righteous priest was confused because his reaction is to hold on to these laws of nature that are completely predictable and say, can you tell me how this is going to be possible? Now, I love the angel Gabriel's response because it reminds me of this story that Father Paul always loves to tell about when he was in Romania and he was allowed to go home and he said to the patriarch, I thought I was only allowed to go every other year. I already went home last year. I don't know if I'm supposed to be able to go home. And the patriarch said, Nadim, I'm the patriarch of Romania. I love that story because this is what we've got here. <laughs> Zechariah is like, how is this going to happen? He said, I'm the angel Gabriel, which means God is a strong warrior. 
I was just talking to God yesterday. <laughs> I, I, God told me to tell you this. What do you want me to say? I am the messenger of the Lord. How is this possible? I mean, there's no one else to appeal to. The Lord said. So put the idea out of your mind that you're somehow going to grasp this or figure it out because it's not even my job to figure this out or to grasp it. I just tell you the message. I'm just a messenger. We let the guy upstairs make all the decisions and figure all the stuff out. We don't do any of the figuring out when it comes to my job. I'm a warrior. The warrior follows what the general says. The warrior doesn't come up with strategy. The Lord is the one who's going to come up with the strategy. I'm just telling you, your time is coming. You're going to have a baby. The less you think about it, the more comfortable you're going to be with it, I'm sure. It's important here, Richard. I want to come back to something, this question of El Elohim, Yahweh Elohim, because it's complicated, and I know people struggle to hear what Father Paul is saying in the rise of Scripture. I know it's difficult because when I've talked about it in homilies and in Bible studies, people struggle with what I'm saying. It's not complicated, but it's difficult to hear because of the way our minds have been Hellenized. So I want to explain it again with respect to your comment about Gabriel. It's not just that Gabriel is a messenger. Gabriel is the prosopon of El. That's a big deal. Remember that in the classical world, there were many temples of Athena, and you would refer to this in the plural, the Athenas. Scripture uses this mechanism with respect to El, and it looks at all of the temples of all of the gods, and it says, enough is enough. Elohim is God. So all of the temples... All of the gods are replaced by Elohim, the universal God. So El is referred to in the plural, Elohim. Every god is overwritten, is deleted, is superseded, is overrun by Elohim. Hence the universalized plural. That's the function of this mask, the prosopon. So in this sense, when you face Gabriel, who is preaching to you, Gabriel functions as a shepherd. <laughs> because he's preaching the instruction directly from Elohim. So he is Elohim to your face. You are in his presence, as we just heard. When you hear the expression, Yahweh, your Elohim, the text is telling you, that the local deity of the sons of Israel in the Near Eastern pantheon is your Elohim. But ultimately, Elohim is the universalized deity, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. That's functionality. That's how control works. And that's how control is wrested from human beings and placed squarely in God's hands in the wilderness wherever he wants to speak. Highly, highly important for truly understanding what's happening here in Luke. And behold, you shall be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their proper time because I'm the one who speaks nobody else speaks that's the point Elohim speaks Elohim speaks that is how control is rested from everyone and that is how we face him in the temple or in the wilderness. Gabriel came to speak, to evangelize these things to Zecharias. Zecharias was there to watch his wife have a baby and receive the word. That's it. The fact that he's not allowed to speak it reminds me of Ezekiel. Ezekiel was given the word, he had to shut up, and then he was allowed to speak, but only the words of Scripture. These things are preached, they are evangelized to Zecharias so that nothing might come out of his mouth but Scripture. Beautiful. 
Wait, I just said something, Rich. My apologies. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.